And now I would like to uh, continue with the right to self-determination and uh, we have uh, succeeded in uh, having uh, two eminent experts uh, in this field and uh, contrary to, to our program I would like to start with uh, Theodor Christakis uh, from the University of Grenoble and then Chris Borgen. Uh, Theodor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Vlad, and I would uh, uh, like to thank you very, very warmly for this invitation. Exactly one year later, after the events, uh, this very interesting conference, uh, which created a real dilemma for me because uh, I wanted to be in each one of the panels. All, our, all panels are exciting, but I had to prove myself uh, realistic. So I uh, introduced myself in the first panel about self-determination and secession in international law. Uh, I have to say from the outset that uh, we have a lot of uh, Russians and Ukrainians in this conference, and sometimes it's uh, getting a little bit uh, warm. Uh, I must say to you from the outset that I am writing about these topics for more than 20 years now. I have published a book uh, in 1980 of 600 pages about self-determination outside the colonial context, which means in tempore non suspecto. And I try to have an impartial approach about this topic, which could be probably helpful. And uh, uh, the second thing that I would like to say from the outset is that uh, uh, of course, what I will discuss concerns Crimea, the topic of this conference, but all the things that I will say will also be valid for what's going on right now in East Ukraine, which I put in parentheses in all my presentation. And uh, uh, finally, I would like to say that I will not discuss as such here the contradictions, the policy contradictions in relation with uh, these uh, conflicts. Uh, I will not discuss here, for example, the inconsistence and double standards of Western states, uh, which are uh, pretty clear, as a matter of fact. Uh, there is uh, no doubt about the fact that Western states often violate it in a very cynical way, uh, international law. And uh, uh, I would just like to remind what my colleague in Geneva, Marcelo Cohen, wrote during this event, who said, are the accusers being consistent? Uh, they are the ones who violated international law so many times, and he gives a lot of examples. And he concludes, contradiction in international policy and disregard for international law when it suits the interest of one side or another come at a price. Western capitals have been left helpless against Russia, not militarily or economically, they have been morally helpless. In any case, it was music to my ears to hear the American representative to the UN Security Council so vigorously reiterate the support of the United States for the principles of the United Nations Charter, uh, thanks to the events in Crimea. And this happened exactly 11 years after the aggression of Iraq uh, by the United States, an intervention that deeply and profoundly destabilized that country, as we all see today. And just nine months after the US and France uh, stated that we, they were prepared to bomb Syria uh, without a UN Security Council authorization. Uh, I will not discuss here this contradiction of Western states and many others, including in relation with Kosovo, because the reason is simple. Two wrongs do not make a right, and the fact that Western states violated international law uh, sometimes uh, hardly entitles Russia Russia to violate international law by um infringing uh, Ukrainian's territorial integrity. So I will not discuss all these events here. My focus will be only to try to 
uh, uh, show you here the positive law of international law, positive law in relation with self-determination and secession. I will try to be as pedagogic as uh, possible so that uh, the person who said that understands nothing about international law will be able at the end of my presentation to have uh, a slight idea about what international law has to say about secession and self-determination. So uh, my outline is very simple. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, oh, I have to turn also this. Uh, my outline will be very, very simple. Uh, first, I will ask, is there a right to secession for the inhabitants? Was there a right for the inhabitants of Crimea and East Ukraine? And then, uh, if we found out that there was no right to secession, could we consider, nonetheless, that the secession of Crimea was prohibited? Is there a right on the one hand? Is it prohibited on the other? Let's start with the first uh, point. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it has already been stated that Russia took a very clear position in all its declarations uh, in uh, the UN organs uh, and political declarations saying that what happened in Crimea was a genuine exercise of the right of self-determination as we found it in the UN Charter. Very simple things. And uh, as a matter of fact, a few states like Armenia, Nicaragua, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, or uh, the Democratic uh, the, uh, the, uh, North Korea followed Russia Russia in this same path, but respectfully, I will show to you that this argument cannot be admitted under positive law. First point, let's speak about external self-determination and demonstra demonstrate the inexistence of a right to external self-determination outside the colonial context. As a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we know that uh, the principle of self-determination uh, was introduced in positive law for the first time in 1945 in the UN Charter. And then we had uh, several instruments of the UN General Assembly which clarified exactly the meaning of self-determination. Self-determination, external self-determination, the right to create an independent state, was given only to two types of territories. Trust territories, under meaning uh, chapter of chapter 12 of the UN Charter, which only concerned 11 territories, and this is only historic today, and uh, mostly non-self-governing territories uh, under the chapter 11 of uh, UN Chapter, UN Charter, and uh, progressively the UN General Assembly adopted criteria in order to understand who has a right to external self-determination, who is considered as a colonized people. Uh, mostly what happened was that in 1960, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution, a famous resolution, 1514 and 1541, where it introduced the idea that the only people who could have a right to external self-determination were people colonized by, the, uh, by some Western powers, and more precisely, the UN General Assembly used the criterion of geographical distance which means that the UN General Assembly said that uh, only a territory which is geographically separate and is distinct ethnically from the country administrating can have a right to external self-determination. And on the basis of this criteria, and especially this uh, specific geographical uh, distinctness, we elaborated in the UN what you see there, the salt water test, which means what? Which means that uh, as a matter of fact, self-determination uh, applied where the domination of one people from another crosses seas and oceans, but does not apply where the domination of one people from another crosses just lakes, uh, mountains or rivers, which means, for example, the rivers of Eastern Europe or the Soviet Union or China or all these territories which have been, between commas, colonized by others than the West. And uh, this, uh, so we apply this criterion of salt water test, uh, despite the famous uh, expression of uh, the French ambassador in the UN who tried to avoid the applicability of this criterion for Algeria and uh, who said, 
said that uh, uh, Algeria, uh, that, that the Mediterranean flows through France like the Seine River flows through Paris. But of course, he convinced nobody. So uh, on the basis of this criteria, uh, we established a list that you all know, uh, the Decolonization Committee. And uh, uh, we only wanted to focus, only wanted to focus on, on one precise historical phenomenon, extremely important, which was the colonization of some territories in Africa. Uh, uh, for, uh, uh, here is an image of the Congress of Berlin, uh, in Asia and in the Pacific and the oceans from Western states. And the only ones who were considered as having non self governing territories were some Western states, namely Australia, Belgium, France, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Portugal, Spain, the United Kingdom, and the United States. There are still today 17 non self governing territories who have a right to external self determination. The last one was in 2013, the introduction of French Polynesia uh, in the list of the UN. Beyond this context of decolonization, there is no right to external self-termination, no right to secession. Of course, this position of the UN has been criticized, the salt water test. There were so many scholars saying that, uh, after all, there is no reason, no moral justification to separate classical colonialism from other forms of domination, ex exploitation, colonization or whatever, and uh, as uh, uh, you can uh, see uh, uh, in the second line here, uh, a scholar said that after all, every demand Every demand for self-termination is presumably based on a subjective conviction that present rule is alien or colonial and that its continuance cannot really be tolerated. So there are, very, uh, there are uh, dozens, hundreds of ethnic groups in this planet who have extremely good uh, arguments from a historical point of view, from a moral point of view, from a political point of view, and we heard all of these arguments in the Crimean crisis. Uh, uh, saying that Crimea is historically Russian land, a Sevastopol is a Russian city, this is what Putin said, and the argument that one day Khrushchev uh, uh, woke up in 1954 and gave Crimea, who was uh, Russian uh, since uh, two centuries. So from this point of view, uh, we have to say very clearly that under positive law, uh, these historical claims have absolutely no relevance. They're interesting from other points of view, historical, political, ethnological, whatever you want. But from a positive uh, law uh, point of view, it's impossible. Already in 1961, you can see here the declaration of Lord Home, the Prime Minister of the UK in the Union General Assembly. He was very angry because was, we were about to destroy the British Empire using self-determination. And he said, is there to be one principle for Asia and Africa and another for Europe? One rule for the British Commonwealth and another for the Russian Empire? I thought if a principle was anything, it was universal. We have to apply it also to the colonies of the Soviet Union and of Russia, of China, etc., etc. But of course, this was not successful because, as we said, uh, the UN focused exclusively on a specific historical uh, phenomenon. So, why? The reason is very simple, because we thought that uh, it was impossible to give self external self-determination to all 6,000 ethnic groups uh, who, who could claim, who feel themselves as distinct and who could be very happy to create a state. This uh, would be a terrible disaster for international security. And at the same time, we had the feeling that the process of decolonization, uh, colonial self-determination, it was justified from a historic point of view. And at the same time, it was contained, very much contained. About 100 states were born from this process. But this took place in a very orderly way for many reasons that I could explain. So from this point of view, it's very clear that the inhabitants of Crimea, or of Donetsk, or the Catalans, or the Quebecois, or the Kurds, or whatever you want, do not have a right to external self-determination under positive international law. So what about these historical claims? You understand very well that if we try to undo 
do history, to use self-determination in order to correct all historical injustice, this is impossible. Uh, and where are we going to stop? Where are we going to stop the processes? Are we going to put a pause at the moment where every nation, ethnic group, had the most of the territory? I put there Alexander the Great and the empire that the Greeks who claim, could claim today uh, go to, to uh, India and Afghanistan. I don't know how Mr. Tsipras will be able to pay for all this. Uh, but anyway, uh, I would uh, uh, also like to, uh, I know that there are four Italian colleagues here who will be disappointed if I don't speak about uh, uh, the Roman Empire. And uh, as a matter of fact, in 1919, during the League of Nations, when we're drafting and we're talking about uh, correct historical injustice, the Italian, Italian delegates expressed a very marked predilection for the empire of Adrian. Uh, so uh, what uh, to say about Crimea? This is uh, uh, what the French ambassador in the UN Security Council said. Crimea was Russian from 1783 to 1954. What does that mean? Will we take out our history books to review our borders or challenge or defend them? What date will we go back to? After all, Crimea was Russian for 170 years, but a vassal of Turkey for three centuries. We know only too well that anything can be justified by history, particularly the unjustifiable. So you see it's a kind of matrioska doll process if we try to undo history, and this will lead to impasse and disaster. This is why probably Russia also always had a very strong opposition to secession, until, till, uh, the, at least until till, uh, the, the Kosovo events. Uh, Russia was such a strong opponent to secession, I don't have the time, unfortunately, to present everything, but I have so many declarations, positions of Russia everywhere, internally, externally, including a memorandum uh, initiated by Russia in 1995, where all all Commonwealth uh, uh, of independent states, former Soviet Union republics, committed themselves uh, not to support separatist movement and separatist regimes and to take action against separatist uh, regimes. And this suddenly, of course, changed in 2008 uh, because of this uh, surprising uh, Western support for Kosovo's independence, where uh, Russia felt really uh, humiliated. And we saw uh, what happened immediately afterwards, in August 2008, what was the price to pay, but it, is, it wasn't the Western states who paid the price, it was Georgia who paid the price, and then we see now what is going on also with uh, the events in uh, Crimea. Uh, of course, Russia didn't sp never spoke till now openly about a right to external self-determination and general right, they just spoke about remedial secession in 2008, and then in 2009, in the pleadings in front of the ICJ, Russia for the first time was in favor favor of remedial secession, which brings us to this final argument, uh, which is about remedial secession. You all know that this is uh, a, a theory according to which there is, of course, no general right to secession outside the colonial context, but there might be as a limited right, a specific right, in case of massive violation of human rights for an ethnic group. And this is what Russia hinted in relation, I'm sorry, in relation uh, with uh, Crimea, saying that, uh, well, uh, uh, we were there to defend our citizens, uh, etc. But there are two major problems with this. One, there are a lot of doubts that this theory forms, past, forms uh, uh, part of uh, positive international law. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, we can find no treaty, nothing in practice which clearly affirms that there is a right to remedial secession. We only base this theory on an a contrary interpretation of a saving clause of a saving clause of uh, Resolution 2625. And from a legal point of view, it is impossible to create such a theory on the basis of an a contrary interpretation. On the other hand, uh, we don't have enough practice in Topino Juris, and uh, the pleadings in front of the ICJ uh, clearly demonstrated that the uh, uh, international community remains entirely split. Some states indeed took position in favor of the positivity of uh, uh, remedial secession, 
I can give you the names of these states, for example, Albania, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Ireland, Jordan, Lithuania, the Maldives, the, the Netherlands, Poland, Russia, Slovenia, Switzerland, and Kosovo. But on the other hand, other states took very strong positions against this uh, theory. Argentina, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Bolivia, Brazil, Burundi, China, Cyprus, Iran, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, Spain, Venezuela, Vietnam, and others. So how can we talk about the existence of a custom? Conclusion of the first part, I will be very quick for the second part. Conclusion of the first part, no right to secession for Crimea or the Russians of Eastern Ukraine. But does this mean that their secession is prohibited? First thing to observe, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm sorry, but uh, I have to turn up. Uh, uh, here and there. First thing to, pro pro to observe from this point of view, international law does not authorize secession, as we said, but in principle, with a reservation that we'll make later, does not prohibit secession either. Which means that you can search all treaty law, customary law, you will find no prohibition of secession as such, which is a little bit surprising, because if you look at the constitutions, I, I did a comparative uh, analysis of 110 constitutions, and you will see that the overwhelming majority of this constitution prohibits secession uh, in the national level, and even in places like the United States, where the constitution says nothing, the constitutional courts always said that secession is prohibited. In Texas versus White, for example, in the United States, it was very, uh, very clear that the union is, was indissoluble it's impossible for Texas to opt out from the United States uh, um, uh, under a right, under a constitutional law. So, how can we explain the fact that states do not prohibit at the international level what they prohibit at the national level? Well, the answer is very easy, as a matter of fact, as we said, including uh, quoting Russia. Uh, the practice of states here is extremely contradictory, because on the one hand, states prohibit secession at home, but on the other hand, they are always ready to help separatists in other places and uh, to, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, when it comes for the, uh, uh, for the territory of uh, a neighbor state, then things could really change, which means that we don't have coherent practice here and we don't have a custom and in any way states know that they cannot end history, they cannot send cartographers at home, history will continue, secession will continue and the map of the world will change. And the court clearly said this in 1910, and they were right that general international law contains no applicable prohibition of declarations of independence. So, when we organize a referendum in Crimea or elsewhere, or when we declare independence as separatists, like many, many separatist movements, do we violate international law? Clearly, no. I was uh, interviewed by many medias last year, at, before the referendum in Crimea, and I said that the referendum is not illegal as such. A referendum is not illegal as such, and I created a lot of reactions. I said what could be illegal is external intervention in favor of the separatists. But the fact that Catalonia uh, uh, organized a referendum a few uh, uh, months ago was not a violation of international law, as a matter of fact. This is what James Crawford said in the court. He said, Mr. President, members of the court, I'm a devoted uh, South Australian. I hereby declare the independence of South Australia. What has happened? Nothing. Have I committed an internationally wrongful act in your presence? Of course not. This is not a violation of international law. This is just, he said, the sound of one hand clapping. Of course, this referendum was contrary to the uh, Ukrainian constitution, it goes without saying, but this does not mean that it was contrary to international law, because as we all know, and the court said this since 1926, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, constitutions are mere facts for international law. The fact that something is contrary to a national constitution does not mean at all that it is contrary to uh, international law. Which means what? Which means that Outside situations of decolonization, the critical test is the test of effectiveness. Each separatist group can try, can have a try to do secession, can attempt to secede. Well, if they succeed, if they succeed in doing what? If they succeed in throwing away, kicking away from the territory uh, the uh, central government uh, and uh, establish effective control, 
then probably a new state could be created. So the critical test normally, I'm sorry, always I have this problem, the critical test outside situations of uh, decolonization is the test of effectiveness, which means was the state able to establish, uh, was the ent entity able to establish the constitutive elements of a state, population, territory, government, which must be sovereign, which means that the state, the new entity, has over it no authority other than that of international law. And this is what happened in Crimea. They took possession of all the administrative buildings, they kicked out the Ukrainian police, they uh, so, uh, surrounded the uh, these, um, uh, places where the Ukrainian army was and tried to establish effectiveness. So, uh, from this point of view, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it is clear clear that uh, a separatist group could have a, a try, two minutes. Uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, international law is not neutral in this game. Secession is not authorized, secession is not prohibited, but uh, there is no doubt about the fact that international law creates a lot of obstacles for secession, and we have several separatist movements who were able to establish effective control for a long time, Somaliland, Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, Chechnya in the 90s, and who were never considered as states. Why? Because international law, as a matter of fact, creates an effect, a presumption against the effectiveness of secession and in favor of the territorial integrity of the parent state. And finally, what is critical is, is secession irreversible? Are we in a situation where there is no hope of establishing the status quo ante? And from this point of view, there is undoubtedly a right of states, including Ukraine, to protect their territorial integrity. Last point, Mr. President, last point. There is nonetheless a major limitation, including to recognition, which is that if there is external intervention by a third state, then clearly the situation created is illegal. This will be a violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4, and we have a lot of practice in this field, clear practice, which demonstrates that in some situation, in case of violation of a fundamental rule of international law, like, for example, in case of aggression, see what happened with the Turkish Republic of North Cyprus, or in, other, in case of violation of other rules, like in the Batustans case or the South Rhodesia case, even if we have a successful uh, and effective situation created after a separatist attempt, a de facto situation, effectiveness, even if we have effectiveness, this, the outcome of this situation will not be accepted because at the origins we have a violation of fundamental rule of international law. And I was very happy to see that the ICJ, in 1998, I wrote this book in order to combat this uh, uh, old idea of Yelinek, according to which, uh, well, uh, the creation of a state is like a primary fact, and uh, uh, it's like the birth of the person. Jover Hoffen wrote that, well, if we have a rape and there is, a, a, there is a, a, a child who is born after this rape, well, it will exist, although it was a violation of the law, but precisely I wrote this book in order to demonstrate that the creation of moral persons like states is not the same thing as the, the birth of natural persons, and I was very happy to see that the ICJ said that indeed as a matter of fact, when there are situations of unlawful use of force or other egregious violations of norms of general international law uh, of use against, then the outcome should not be accepted, which immediately raises the question, is there, was there an illegal Russian intervention in Crimea? There are a lot of elements to demonstrate this, but we'll have other panels. And this leads me to my final conclusion, very uh, 30 seconds, not more. We have a very difficult situation because on the one hand, right now in Crimea, we have an illegal situation and normally we should respect the principle ex in uria jus non oritur, which means our attachments to the principles of international law and non-recognition. But on the other hand, we have a de facto situation and how can we ignore that Crimea is now annexed de facto by Russia and this annexation, unlawful as it is, but achieved without bloodshed, was very probably what the majority of the population of Crimea wanted, although there were a lot of irregularities in this referendum, it is rather clear, and the answer to this is like uh, all, in all other similar situations, we'll have a very big tension, conflict between the law and the facts 
we need to negotiate, like we need to negotiate in Palestine, we, like we need to negotiate in the Turkish Republic of North Cyprus and in Western Sahara in order to try to find out solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this passionate, uh, vivid and instructive presentation. Uh, uh, as usual, when I'm listening to, to Theodor Christakis, I disagree with most of his says. Uh, but we'll have uh, uh, probably an opportunity to discuss some issue. Uh, Chris, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Vladek, for the invitation to participate in this conference. And thank you to all of the conference organizers. Uh, my name is Chris Borgen. I'm a professor of law at St. John's University in New York. Uh, and what I would like to do for the next few minutes, uh, and pardon for my standing up here so that I don't have to be faced away from you uh, to look at my own slides, is I would like to talk about uh, something that, was, that in part was related to what Professor Christiakis just spoke about, but then extend from that a little bit. And that's to talk about the form and function of international legal arguments concerning self-determination in the Ukrainian conflict. So to do this, I'd like to do three things over the course of the next few minutes. First, I'm sorry if that's a little dim, first I want to talk about what is the law of self-determination. This is what was largely covered in the first talk, but to, to try to set down a baseline of what the current consensus is, even though there are some disagreements, what the current consensus is in regard to self-determination. This is something in particular relation to the question of the relationship of self-determination and secession. The next thing that I want to do is then to talk about what are the legal arguments actually being made at the moment, and I'm going to focus in on arguments being made by Russia and by the United States in regards to self-determination and secession. And I'll do this in a comparative basis, as I'll explain in just a moment. And third, I want to say, why bother with legal arguments? Um, at the very beginning of today's conference, we had an invocation of the Melian dialogue that the strong do what they will, the weak suffer what they must. So why in the face of power do we bother talking about international law? So I want to make a pitch as to why international legal argument is important. First, on the comparative basis, I just want to mention briefly that I think it's important to talk about the situation in Ukraine not in isolation, but in a comparative basis in regards to other arguments that have been made by key countries in relation to other conflicts in the region that have some similar sets of facts, such as the conflicts over Transnistria, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Nagorno-Karabakh. So I'll be referring to arguments in regards to those conflicts as well in my talk. So, why talk about law in the face of issues of power? The reason that I think it's important to keep in mind international law is for a few reasons. First, international law essentially works as a vocabulary of international relations. It defines the terms that states use so that we understand what we're saying when we speak with one another. That's why you have things like incredible debates over the definition of aggression before the International Criminal Court. It also works as a grammar. That is, it tells us not just the definition of words, but which words make sense in relation to each other, just like a grammar does in regards to a language. So think of it this way. We understand what the meaning of the term aggression is, but when you think about it grammatically in a sentence such as this, my country is now going to use my right to aggression, that doesn't make a lot of sense in international relations. Because in the grammar of international law, you don't have a right to aggression. So it tells us not only how a word is defined, but how that word relates to other words in diplomatic, in diplomatic practice. So the two terms that we're going to be especially interested in are self-determination and territorial integrity. That's at the heart of really what this debate is in regards to, in regards to Crimea, in regards to Kosovo, and to these other instances. So first. I'll, first, I'm going to talk about law for a little bit, which has already been covered in our first talk, but there are a few things I want to underline from that. And then from there, I'm going to talk about rhetoric, how this is being used by different countries in the arguments that they make. So, um, Professor Christiakis did a fantastic job giving a, the big uh, sort of uh, history of the role of self-determination, or the definition of self-determination. Um, it's, it's moved essentially from an idea of a political aspiration to one of a legal right. And besides the UN's charter, the, one of the other texts that I want to focus in on are the 
is the first article from the International Covenant from Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant from Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, both of which have the same uh, first article, which says that all peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Now, in regards to our discussion, though, the underlying question here is, does self-determination mean that a quote-unquote people, which we haven't defined yet, can dismember a state. Now, in relation to this, I want to call back some of the questions from the first panel where, there was, where they were being pressed on the idea of, what do, you, do you believe that there is still a right of self-determination? I think in some of those questions, the issue was not so much a question of a self-determination. The question there was really a question in terms of whether or not there was a right to secession, and that really is what we're talking about. And I think defining the terms carefully and how they relate to each other can perhaps deal with some of the confusion, some of the theoretical confusion that occurs in some of these discussions. So there are really two questions here that we're talking about. The first is the who question. Who has a right of self-determination? And then the second one is, what would that remedy require or allow? Now I'm going to pick up on some of the themes from the first uh, talk that we just heard, but I want to pull out a few other types of examples or a few other scenarios besides the issue of decolonization. So there are two answers in regards to those two questions that I just said. The first is what I'm going to call the consensus view, which I have to say Professor Christiakis, I think, gave a good sense of what that definition is. And a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be in agreement with many of the points that he made. The second is what I call the leading minority view, which is the extreme circumstances view, which was also described. But I'm going to say a couple of more words about that. Um, so first, in regards to the first question, what is a people? In different times, in diplomatic history, we've had different answers to that question. Sometimes we've said that the people are residents of a colony. That's during the time of decolonization. Some have argued that it should be an ethnic group. It should be a religious minority. It should be the citizens of a state. These are all different ways that the idea of people have been defined or are defined now by different entities that are arguing about self-determination. The Quebec Commission, which was the commission that was asked by the National Assembly of Quebec, to look at issues of self-determination in regards to questions of Quebecois sovereignty, said that the very fact that the right of self-determination and sense of independence has been recognized solely in colonial peoples is an indication that this right takes on or can take on different meanings for other category of peoples. So the whole point is that the term people, when we talk about the self-determination of peoples, actually has multiple meanings. So one of the ways that this has been summarized, and this is sort of cribbing from James Crawford from his treatise on statehood, is this. We can think of peoples having sort of four main definitions in international law. They are former colonies, era of decolonization. They are states themselves. So for example, I'm an American citizen. All American citizens, we make up the people of America. That's one people. By mutual agreement of a, a pre-existing state and the entity that's seeking to have rights and self-determination. And this last definition, which is long, and I put, I put the whole definition here. This is a definition from a treatise. It's not from a specific legal text. But it's worth mentioning because it's the one that you hear arguments about in regards to Ukraine right now. And that is where there are there's a distinct political geographical area that's arbitrarily excluded from any share of government such that it's in effect non-self-governing. I'm going to come back to that in a moment in regards to Crimea and to a certain extent Eastern Ukraine. So the legal question is, are, is the population of Crimea or Donetsk, if you want to think about Eastern Ukraine, are they a people? That is, are they a self-determination unit? Do they meet one of those definitions that I just listed? Well, if you can go through that, you can, come, you can answer this fairly quickly. Are they a former colony in the way that was just described a moment ago by Professor Christiakis? No. Are they a state? Or is Crimea a state, a pre-existing state? No. Is it by mutual agreement with the Ukrainian government? I would leave it to the Ukrainian lawyers here to define that, um, whether or not that exists. I would think that the answer is no, since the Ukrainian constitution and the Crimean constitution both say that the rights of Crimea are, subs are subsumed by the Ukrainian constitution. And what about this, the, this definition on political geographic areas? Well, there's been some arguments that perhaps because of Yanukovych fleeing that they should be viewed in this way. I think that that would be a rather extreme interpretation of saying that they are non-self-governing. To the opposite extreme, Crimea has had large rights of autonomy in Ukrainian history. To the, it has its own constitution, it has its own national assembly. This is precisely the type of situation that is not envisioned by this definition. 
So the legal question, how I would answer this and how I think it's answered in most views in, in regards to self-determination, is the population of Crimea a self-determination unit in that sense? My answer would be no. The, but the important thing to keep in mind is that Ukraine is. Ukraine is a pre-existing state. It has its right of self-determination, and that right can be frustrated by external intervention so that it's not able to basically undertake its own political organization and economic decisions. So the second question which we have is, if Crimea was a self-determination unit, what would it receive as a remedy? In other words, what does self-determination mean? This is where you get to the question about secession. Now, this has already been covered in the first talk, so I'm going to answer this fairly briefly. I'm going to go through the slides relatively quickly. First, what are the remedies available under a right of self-determination? Under the consensus view, the argument is essentially what we heard in the first talk, that the remedy is one based on context. The right of statehood is basically in the decolonization context, and that there is no right to secession. Put another way is this, the silence of international law. There's no right to secede, but secession itself is not illegal. So that secessions are treated as a fact, not as a right and not as an illegality in and of itself. That's when we're thinking about secession, when it's a domestic group that is saying, to take the example, I now declare that I'm a country. That that is not regulated by international law. So the result is that even if you chose to make the argument, and even if you win on the argument that Crimea is a self-determination unit, it doesn't get a right of statehood as a matter of operation of law. And what does happen is that if it chooses to separate or if it undertakes actions in which it separates, it becomes an issue of whether or not it becomes recognized as a state. And some of our colleagues will be talking more about issues of recognition and non-recognition tomorrow, so I'll leave that to them. So that's what I'd argue is the consensus view. It's essentially the view along the lines of what was described in the first talk. There's also the extreme circumstances view, which is basically this idea that when there are extreme circumstances, perhaps you have a right of remedial secession. As was mentioned, this was related to the Friendly Relations Declaration 2625 and uh, the Safeguard Clause, which has been interpreted by some to mean that if self-determination is frustrated in a state, that in those cases, their, the rights of territorial integrity might not be protected. However, I think that that is a view that is not supported by international law. And the reason is this. To pick up on a couple of themes from the first talk, but which I want to focus in on. There are basically two sources of international law that we largely look to for things like this. Treaty law and customary international law. So the first thing is, can we point to a treaty that says there is a right of remedial secession? No, it doesn't exist. How about customary international law? Is there customary international law that shows that there's a right of remedial secession? Well, for customary international law, we look at practice by a significant number of states over a period of time undertaken out of a sense of legal obligation. Do we have that here? In terms of state practice, depending on how you want to count, there have been between one and three secessions con contested by the pre-existing state since World War II that have actually been successful, but in terms of the international community largely giving recognition. There have been at least 20 attempted secessions in which the pre-existing state has been against it, which have not been successful. So you don't have any consistent state practice in, in support of remedial secession. How about in regards to opinio juris? In the Kosovo advisory opinion, the International Court of Justice said that there are radically different views amongst states in regards to remedial secession, and that whether international provides a right of remedial secession is, is highly contested. If the International Court of Justice says this in terms of looking at what states believe, then you can't say that there's consistent opinio juris, a consistent sense of legal obligation to remedial secession. You have neither state practice nor opinio juris. So based on accepted sources of international law and on common practices of interpretation, there is no right to remedial secession. Now the reason I'm highlighting those is because this is what I want to in part talk about or come back to in relation to the evolution of legal arguments of self-determination. So here what I want to do is look for a few minutes at what states have actually been saying. So in Kosovo, there's the US's recognition statement, which, as you know, it basically says that Kosovo was sui generis. It was, it was a special case. And the US had been criticized to a certain extent for this statement. Um, and, and other EU states, and there are certain EU states, I should say, that also had similar statements. The idea is that Kosovo is unique, and don't worry, it's not precedent. 
But let's look at what Russia said at that time. Prime Minister, for, excuse me, Foreign Minister Lavrov had said that the separation of Kosovo would be the subversion of all the foundations of international law. Very strong statement against the idea that Kosovo should be able to secede. Um, Vladimir Putin said at the same time that it's a two-ended stick and that the second end is going to come back and hit them in the face if Kosovo is allowed to secede. Once again, a very strong statement against this idea of, of se secession at all. So is there a principal distinction between Kosovo and, say, South Ossetia, which is the way that it, you could say it came back and hit people in the face about one year later? So let's take a look at what Russia and the US has t said in relation to the questions that I'd set out for the first few minutes. So who has a right of self-determination? In Russia's argument before the International Court of Justice in the advisory opinion, it said that um, it is widely accepted that the population of a trust or mandated territory of a non of a non-self-governing territory or an existing state taken as a whole undisputedly qualifies as a self-determination unit. So they, they're emphasizing statehood, the state as being the relevant self-determination unit. They say that whether a group, an ethnic group within an existing state qualifies is subject to extensive debates. So in their arguments before the ICJ, they say the idea of applying this to a sub-state group is debatable. It then goes on to say um, that the words, the will of the people, um, sh so should essentially be thought of, it could be said to, to refer to the population of Kosovo only, that some might say that, but really we should think about it as the population of Serbia as a whole. So the will of the people is the will of the total population of the pre-existing state. And I want you to, in part, think of this in relation to statements that are made in regards to Crimea, and I'm going to come to those in just a moment. So, and finally, they mentioned that you can't use administrative autonomy as evidence that a group qualifies as a people. And as they said, that the population of Kosovo has never been recognized as a self-determination unit. Um, we heard earlier from Anatoly Kapustin, so here's from his memo, which went to the International Law Association in regards to Crimea. So here he said, the expressed will of the Crimean people, now it's simply stating without further explanation that Crimea constitutes a people. And, by means of a referendum against the realization by the Crimean people of the principle of self-determination of peoples, once again without explanation, but somehow that, the, that not allowing Crimea to become an independent unit is against the self-determination of peoples. A very different type of argument than what we'd seen re previously by Russian international lawyers. So what remedy? And I'll say just a few words and, and finish up in just a couple of moments. So Russia's argument in Kosovo had said that um, the idea of the safeguard clause, which we've been talking about, should actually be viewed to serve the guarantee, the territorial integrity of the state. So when it argued this in front of, in front of the International Court of Justice, it said the, the safeguard clause does not give a right of remedial secession. To the other extent, it's one of territorial integrity. If there's an argument in regards to remedial secession, it should be where the, it, the situation is so extreme that it's threatening the very existence of the people in question. So query whether or not that was actually the case in Crimea, whether or not there was a threat of, to the very existence of the Crimean people. I, it, it would be extremely difficult to try to make any type of argument like that. So what about US arguments in regards to Kosovo? Here the thing is that the US took a very different tack. It didn't argue this in terms of general arguments of self-determination. It argued it in relation to the question that was actually put before the ICJ. The U.S. says general international law does not, as a general matter, prohibit or authorize declarations of independence. It's silent as to declaration of independence, what we basically described previously as being more or less the consensus view. It says that Serbia asks that there is a general prohibition on, on uh, secession, but there is no such prohibition under international law. There's no such prohibition to declarations under international law. The, the issue would be at times if there's a question of illegal annexation, that could be illegal. And then the U.S. says that the principle of territorial integrity does not regulate internal conduct of groups within states. That is something that runs between states in regards to issues of intervention. So, in closing, Russia's arguments in regards to Crimea, or actually in closing on this and then a couple of last words, is that there's no internal self-determination because of a quote-unquote coup. Um, the, uh, we've seen already some of the arguments from Ambassador Cherkin about the, about the denial of self-determination. But of course, as I was, was describing, that that's a difficult argument to make when you look at the actual law of self-determination. 
Um, and that now Russia has also taken on this unique case argument that the US has used or that the US had mentioned, but here they're saying it in regards to Crimea. So now, closing points. In terms of US rhetoric, it's said that the issue of Kosovo and that these issues in general is not primarily a legal question because there's the silence of the law in regards to declarations of independence. However, you cannot have an illegal annexation. You cannot have an illegal external intervention. The respect of territorial integrity is an obligation among states. It's not one that's specifically having to do with sub-state actors. But we see, as well, changes in how Russia has spoken about this. So Russia has shifted from talking about sovereign rights during the time of Kosovo to rhetoric now about the will of the people and referenda. But not only is it shifted by the emphasis in going from one to the other, it's shifted as well how it defines those terms. Because the will of the people in the time of Kosovo, they talked about as being the will of the population of the state as a whole. But now in Crimea, they're talking about the will of the people of just those in the affected territory. The process of referenda, which is not something that gives any right under international law to, to, to separation, replaces the substance of the law of self-determination and territorial integrity. There's also an emphasis on historical wrongs in the rhetoric, which once again is something new to this type of discussion and something that actually international law has not focused on. The idea of, say, Khrushchev handing over Crimea uh, in the USSR. And finally, embracing this sort of unique case terminology. So, as legal historian and comparativist Lori Malksu has said, the annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation goes against pretty much everything that has been written in Russia over the last 20 years, plus during the Soviet period, on the legality of use in military force and the right of people to self-determination. So in closing this, international law itself is built on traditions of interpretation and the use of sources. It is something that we do consensually among states. The diplomatic rhetoric of states is important because it's able to actually change at times expectations about what international law is. So we need to be careful about how we talk about terms that have long histories, terms that have been well-defined, and not change how we talk about it too quickly for short-term political gains. How we talk about the law can affect how, what the law actually becomes. But if we do it without being adequately careful, then the, what happens is that we become governed by another law, and that's the law of unintended consequences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris, um, in particular for this uh, clear distinction and interrelation between uh, self-determination and secession, which seem to occurs to be uh, to occur to be to uh, separate uh, issues from the perspective of international law. Uh, Professor Wetzlaff Tostig, uh, yes. and I suppose present a Russian position: yes. self-determination. Thank you. So, I begin immediately. I think that uh, there is a, a very big tension between three approaches to the definition of principle of self-determination. The first, for the first, the essence of state is expressed in sovereignty. So self-determination so refers to the government. And uh, in this context, the principle creates conditions for the emergence of sovereignty in a society not yet organized in state and uh, provide the basis for the decolonization. So it is the discourse of our French colleague. And secondly, in this context, the principle ensures the sovereignty of existing states, and in this sense, overlaps with the principle of non-intervention. For the second direction, for the second direction, the essence of state is expressed in human rights. It's a new approach. Self-determination so refers to an individual, uh, in this context, secession is permitted in the case of syst systematic violation, violations of human rights. It's, uh, if, if I don't make a mistake, approach that you share. Uh, so, in this, in this context, secession is permitted in the case of systemic violations of human rights. And for the third direction, the essence of state is expressed in the general will, determined by the general interest. Self-determination, so, refers to the people, 
which has a right to secession if it is excluded from political communications. And here I would like to, to make a quotation. This idea was formulated by Rousseau. He said, he notes, that when the government ceases to obey the laws, the state undergoes contractions. And here you can see the continuations of this passage. I think that Rousseau would disagree with our French colleagues. And um, but I would like that you read it, because it's very important. And I think that, that yes, I continue. I think that the right number of legal arguments, um, yeah, by which of which the idea of general wit should not be ignored. And I see, I also summarize these arguments, and that for me, the principal uh, uh, and most strong is force, the force argument, in accordance with which uh, the principle of self determination can be defined as a general principle of law of civilized nations. So, for summarize my first point, I would insist that there is a tension, axiological tension between free approaches and this tension exists and we should to, to, to take account of, the, of it. Uh, but instead some of us from both sides are engaged in so-called shaming and naming. Then I affirm and from this point of view my Ukrainian colleague is right that there, was some, there is some evidence that after a queue, the Crimean people was excluded from political communications. Now you see five arguments of it. Second presentations. And I would to, to comment uh, the remark of uh, Mr. Zodarozhin, who said that no one uh, member of parliament was excluded from parliament. And I would like to, to show you, you four pictures. First one. These were members of Ukrainian governments. Yes, yeah, sure, they were not excluded. But how many suicides took place in the last two months in Ukraine? But no one member of the parliament. Right? Yeah, because now they are not members of powers. But they were before. Yeah. So I affirm it's true that Ukrainian state disintegrated after the queue. There was not only a breaking of political communication, which could be restored after some times. It's true that it could be restored. More importantly, there was also a breaking of substantial will. In fact, the new government has proposed to the Crimea a new language, new political symbols, new interpretation of history. This is exactly the same thing that led to the civil war in Croatia, Bosnia, Abkhazia, Ossetia, Karabakh, and Kosovo. The same scenario the essence of which was an attempt on the tradition. Yes, it's true that international law now does not prohibit it for many reasons, but sometimes the international community reacts to it, like as it was in the case of Kosovo. And I think that at that point international law must evolve. This tension between, uh, this, this is also this is a second tension between uh, um, general will and substantial will. And this tension was described by Hannah Arendt. And uh, this tension must be solved either by prohibiting such an attempt or by recognizing the secession of the people which rejects it. Then I think that we need to talk not only about the collapse of state but also about their destruction. I would like to to show you a quotation of Giorgio Agamben. The common struggle will be no longer a struggle to control the state, it will be a struggle between the state and the non-state, humanity. So, Ukraine has, it's my, it's my opinion, has never had a lot of statehood. During its history, it often functioned according to the principle of the invisible hand. I remember when I lectured in uh, the Institute of Mr. Zadarozhin, I asked 
students of Kyiv University was the thing about future relations between Russia and Ukraine. And I received the answer, what does it matter if in a few years there won't be any boundaries and everyone will speak English? So I think that one year ago Ukraine has not only sought to join the European Union, but also sought to destroy their statehood and largely did it. Now they have foreigners in the government, a large-scale privatization, incessant appeals to international bodies and to international community, division, division of the country between oligarchic groups, horrible corruption. That's why the authorities don't want to negotiate with the rebels. Russia did it with Chechnya. That's why Ukra Ukrainian political discourse is so poor. That's why Ukrainians don't understand consequences of, of some decisions such as those related to the adoptions of the Washington Consensus of IMF. And I am afraid of it, because I see the same signs in Russia. I'm afraid that the same future is, uh, we are, that we are before the same future. Then I would like to, the last part of my, of my uh, presentation, I would like to summarize some arguments from both sides. I think that you have reason that Russian argumentation is sometimes sometime inconsistent because um, uh, it all overlaps, historical argument overlaps with 20 years independent existence of Ukraine. But I think that Western discourse is also inconsistent. Firstly, you don't know, you don't notice some facts related to the atmosphere of political intolerance existing in Ukraine, the persecution of journalists and political opponents, the perversion of history at official level, the involvement of United States, etc. Secondly, you are relying on some disputable philosophical positions, believing that the others have to accept them. Firstly, you are nominalists. You are often nominalists. The values related to nation, religion, language almost don't exist for you. There is only a single individual and his interests. And you project <coughs> your identity on the identity of Crimean people and don't understand why, why they, they can be dissatisfied of the situation. It's egoistic. Then you are neo-positivists and perceive the law exclusively, exclusively as a result of social consensus. I would like to, yes, if somebody is interested. For you, um, you have right, you feel right, only because you form a majority. It doesn't matter that the situation in Kosovo and in Crimea are similar. More important is that there was consensus on Kosovo case and there is no consensus on Crimea case. And being nominalist, nominalist and neo-positivist, you exclude from your discourse even those who form part of your intellectual tradition. I mean Plateau with the idea of common good, Rousseau with the idea of social contract, Hegel with the idea of substantial, substantial will, etc. So the law now in the discourse of most part of my colleagues is a hermetic world of Kelsen and Hart. But why we should to accept this approach? It's a scientific, scientific, scientific dispute, and we, we are not ob obli obligated to, to, to accept the, the foundations which we not, don't share. And thirdly, even this hermetical world is not holistic. You refer to the documents of the Venice commissions who have not any legitimacy. Then you think that the situation in Kosovo, which you yourselves have considered like a violation of international law, should be the criteria on the situation in Crimea. You talk about democracy and that means the possibility of return of the Crimea to Ukraine, despite the will of 93 persons of its populations. And for finish, I would like to say that I have wrote um, five articles about this problem feeling my duty of citizen. Only um, feeling my duty of citizen. But as a scientist, I'm not interested in this problem. Because for me, the situation in Crimea is a part of more bigger problem. It's, this bigger problem consists in non-integrity of political discourse 
if we, if we don't decide, don't overcome this non-integrity, this problem will generate new and new situations like in Crimea, Kosovo, etc., etc. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much.